recognized in across jurisdictions. So there's a great amount of legal uncertainty in terms of which in which country uh, do you have to actually pay for which patents. And and this legal uncertainty coupled with the with the costs of the of the tickets that have been created make uh, both innovation impossible and, and make creation of cheap devices uh, impossible. So what we are seeing right now uh, with the flurry of cheap device of the uh, with for instance the Indian government try, uh, which is trying to create uh, something called the Akash tablet to any, uh, as a cheap uh, computing device. Well, its creation is going to run into patent-related problems because there are so many patents that are involved in it that selling it for a sub thirty-five dollar price at, at a sub thirty-five dollar price point, as the government is trying to do, is just impossible. So uh, that issue has to be addressed, and it, right now there is no compelling interest amongst different market players uh, to address that issue. Uh, because each one, uh, each one of them is trying to maximize revenues, and uh, and as things stand, there is no government intervention in, in uh, or regulation of this. So uh, as we saw, uh, for instance, in World War One, uh, when uh, patents relating to to uh, uh, to airplanes uh, were brought governmentally into a pool, perhaps it is time to think about doing the same uh, or mobile phones as well, which are providing cheap access. So uh, where uh, the inventors would also be benefited by having, uh, by being provided royalties and uh, the, the regular users will also be benefited by, uh, by actually having access to cheap devices through which they have access to the internet. So uh, this is uh, something that uh, one of the ideas that, uh, that uh, the Center for Internet and Society is doing research on right now. Um, one other, uh, on, so I've, uh, I'll actually save a little bit of time later to talk about spectrum sharing and the other things. Very good. Thanks, Pranish. Um, Christoph, five minutes. You have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Christoph Strick, Nestec from Telefonica. I'm the Public Policy Director. Um, it's my fifth IGF and the first time we speak about connectivity, so I think that's fantastic because I think it's the first step uh, when you speak about the internet that first of all people want you know, to get access to it. Um, and I think uh, so thanks to the organizers for setting up this workshop, I think it's very appropriate. Um, obviously, in contrast to, to some of the things we heard before, um, I'm working at a company which is called Business, it's basically to give connectivity to people. I mean, this is what we do. This is why we're there. and. Uh, and therefore, um, I would like to focus a little bit um, on, on some of the aspects we, we had already, um, which is that basically, if you want to increase the connectivity on a, on a world scale massively, um, the first thing you have to do is think about private investments and how you can improve the conditions for private investments. It's a fact that um, the investment in, in digital infrastructure comes from uh, private companies. Uh, this is behind the huge success of the of the. Uh, mobile sector in the last years uh, has been basically that private companies um, do these investments um, on a commercial basis, obviously. So um, uh, I think the first step then is to think, um, you know, to, to about the right conditions to achieve these investments. And obviously um, this is summarized under the, the nice headline of investment-friendly policies. And, and what we mean with that is that um, if you invest uh, money in a network, a lot of money in a network, you have to have the, the predictability, at least, that you might, over time, you know, get back some of that money. And it's as simple as that. Um, and obviously, uh, a lot of times, you know, when you speak to governments, um, uh, you know, it depends on to whom you speak, and you get different answers. Um, the finance part of the government uh, might ask you to pay more for spectrum licenses, for example, which obviously, in, you know, makes the, in the end, the final product, the access, uh, more expensive somehow um, earned over time. So it is really um, a complex issue, but what we advise usually is that you have to think about how you can make, you know, basically your territory, your country more attractive for these investments, uh, which as I said is around predictability, it's around having the right conditions to, to, uh, to have private companies invest in. Just to give you a number, um, my company last year invested around uh, 9 billion euros um, in the world in, in infrastructure. 
out of that, 60% in Latin America, um, which is obviously uh, a part of the world where you, know, you need to improve productivity quite a lot. So I think these are just an example for one company. If you put all the um, telecom operators together, you might get too much higher numbers. A second thing is, um, and this was touched already on um, by Planish as well, you have to think about the whole value chain um, of, of connectivity. It's not just about the connectivity part. It's about you know how cheap is a smartphone, um, because access in the future will be through smartphones. It will not be through um, PCs, um, it will be or tablets at least, but it will be some form of mobile device. Um, so how, how expensive is that? Is that affordable as well? You have to think about, as I said, the conditions um, under which um, network um, can be built. Uh, there are network infrastructure that needs to be built out, and there are conditions to that as well. So you have to think about the full value chain. And let me finish with um, speaking about the problem we have, obviously, because there are always regions um, which are not connected. And, and sometimes the, what we call the business case for connectivity there is not working out. The reasons are very straightforward and simple. Usually there are not enough people there, so basically building up expensive infrastructure for few people in the end is not a commercial uh, business. So this is where we get into areas where we have all kinds of corporations, and we touch on a couple of them as well. Um, we do similar things. Uh, there's an interesting project running in Peru currently, which we try to roll out in the future to other countries, which is called Connectame. And this is basically about getting a private a public partnership to make the case better, which means basically that they usually involvement of the, uh, of the public administration. The World Bank was included as well to improve the, the situation for the business case in the end, and we achieved to connect more than uh, 200 villages in Peru, which are rural areas, um, to the internet, which is, of course, um, from an economic and social perspective, a fantastic. So. Um, just to finish with a little positive side, connectivity is improving actually around the world. The latest number I've seen is that you have today uh, average global speed um, for internet connectivity of around 3 megabits per second. I think it's quite considerable. When I started in that industry 10 years ago, everything over 200 kilobits was considered broadband. So we are now 10 times on that on average in the world. So there's a massive improvement in connectivity, but we have to go on and that's still challenge. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, Martin, please. Uh, Martin Levy from Hurricane Electric. Um, like Christoph, I, I come from the infrastructure side of the, the business. Um, we move bits around the world. And what I'm going to talk about is going to take you deeper into the guts of the internet, uh, away from the original points about mobile phones and things like zero Facebook with lower number of bits, but into the place where the plumbing moves bits around continents, around countries, um, and around cities. So a couple of key points that, that I want to talk about. Um, the subject that has kept me busy for a ridiculous number of years, the deployment of IP version 6 as a follow-on to the IPv4 protocol that has lasted us 30 years on the internet. This, when now provided at the core of the internet, means that mobile operators, um, hosting providers, content providers, now have a future path for massive connectivity as we increase the number of people, the number of devices, um, the, 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 just the total size of the internet. And it can't be understated that this vector, this, this, this addressing vector of providing more, more addresses, more, more ability for more devices is fundamental to anything else that we do. This isn't an IPv6 session, so I'll be terse about it and just leave it at that until questions. But I'm going to talk about optimizing bandwidth because when you look at the way the internet works, the very use of the word internet, the interconnection of networks, we go back and at our level, at the bulk wholesale moving of bits level, we look at the need to have more efficient internet exchanges to make traffic stay as close and local, to enable caches where content can be brought 
from one place to another to find an efficient place for that data, all of which makes the end user experience much better. They may not see that infrastructure, but it actually is an important part of the cost model. And that brings me on to this other aspect of however you look at it, um, making bits cheaper, making it more cost effective to use the internet in any which way that an end user wants to use it relies on the large infrastructure, the undersea cables, the interconnects, the fiber in the ground, all of those items to be accessible to ISPs, uh, big or small, and to be, enable them to expand their networks. Um, the last part that I want to talk about within this section is um, local knowledge. You can go out to North America, you can go to Europe, you can go to many places in Asia, and you can find fantastic groups of people with, with years and years of experience. Occasionally some of them have gray hair, myself included. Some of them are just young kids that really got it and go out and do it. But it's just as important to find that level of expertise when building infrastructure, whether you're here in Indonesia, whether you're in, in Bangladesh, which I was at the beginning of the year, whether you are anywhere in the world, and you make sure that there are um, people being trained that are finding these avenues to, uh, to, to, to other geeks, to other network engineers, to other people who understand the subtle tricks of running bigger and bigger networks. I'll give you a simple example that, that's relevant to here. Uh, there's been a few rumors, rumblings of people complaining about the Wi-Fi being a bit iffy, especially yesterday afternoon. That's true. But that, to me, is a local issue with inside a building. I spent yesterday morning and a little bit on Monday um, going backwards and forwards with two of the major uh, Indonesian telcos back in, in Jakarta, which are being used for the infrastructure for this uh, uh, this facility. And I went in and said, hey, I'm seeing some bits that are flowing from here to Amsterdam only to come back to Hong Kong. And that didn't seem right. And it isn't right. Of course, it's expensive. Um, and in going backwards and forwards, I was able to, to, to find the right piece of information and give it to the right engineer. And all of a sudden, about like midday yesterday, the routing changed. Things got more efficient. The, it wasn't about the network, the single network here, it was actually about every user in the whole of Indonesia using this particular service provider and getting their network to improve and just be just get that little bit of network knowledge imparted and move on. So it doesn't scale to have somebody like me sitting in a hotel or in a conference going, ooh, that doesn't quite look right. But it does scale if you can get the appropriate entities to do that localized training, to understand how to build internet exchanges, to understand how to run BGP and the routing, the core routing, so that ultimately the bits flow to those end users that want to use those cheaper tablets, cheaper mobile devices, and simply increase the number of online users. So that's my view from way down in the guts. Hopefully something that most people never see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, Raj is uh, batting cleanup today. He's our last... Uh, Scheduled speaker that we're uh, uh, adding a cleanup today. He's our last. Uh, if he doesn't break the microphone, um, so I'll turn it over to Raj. Thanks, David. And I promise I won't touch the microphone after this. Um, so I am Raj Rajneshank. I look after the Internet Society's activities in the Asia Pacific region. It was interesting listening to all the panelists uh, talking uh, because I don't think they've left me much to talk about, which is great. So I can I believe. Um, one, one thing I do want to say, though, is that uh, someone mentioned the spectrum. I, think it's super much um, I was in a, on an earlier panel this morning where the issue of spectrum also came up. Um, I don't know, and, and wireless is the in thing in a lot of uh, uh, ways because people say wireless is the solution to everything. You know, it'll help us connect quicker, faster, maybe cheaper in some instances. But one of the issues I do see is, and I do count this as a barrier to connectivity as well, is the fact that a lot of the spectrum is being auctioned at ridiculous rates by governments. Once you start spending billions of dollars buying spectrum, and which has been the case in some countries in this region, that cost has to come from somewhere. And unfortunately, that will be passed on 
some way or form to the subscriber. Therefore, your subscription rates uh, grow up, go up. Uh, in the two countries that I call home, uh, service providers have recently released uh, LTE-based uh, subscriptions, and in both in both instances, you know, I find it ridiculous to subscribe to that service because it's just too expensive. Yes, I may get things a bit faster, but the fact is, I am only consuming X gigabytes a month anyway, and I'm happy to do it at a slightly slower rate. So, you know, I do think that's a major barrier going forward, particularly if we talk about connecting rural areas where the cost ratio would be much higher. I would imagine someone mentioned that, you know, there's not in a large enough population to support uh, commercial infrastructure rollout. Uh, so that, is, I think, is, is a major issue going forward. Um, what I do want to talk about, though, is something that uh, the Internet Society and a couple of other partners that we got together uh, in 2010 decided to, you know, it, it was more a trial. Let's see what happens. And what we did was uh, conceptualize a project called Wireless for Communities. And basically what it meant was you would know, go to a very rural area, set up, uh, which was pretty much unconnected, set up a rural Wi-Fi network, wire up the community, and just see what happens. Uh, and the experiment has been interesting. Um, in fact, it's been so successful that our partners have really been really gung-ho about it and, and, and gone on and done great things. Now they have eight installations like that across, uh, across India. Uh, but, but, but the key thing there was that we decided that, you know, there's, there's barriers at all levels. There's the policy barriers, the regulatory barriers, financial barriers, and so on and so forth. But there's also the barriers at the very local level. When you bring connectivity to a population which hasn't been connected, the cultural and social barriers as well, which must be uh, addressed. So we decided to involve the community in what we did. Uh, we talked to the village elders. Once we had their uh, go ahead, then we started deploying the network and showing them the sort of impact that the internet could have. Since then, it, you know, it, it's grown tremendously. Um, 11 out of 13 schools in one particular locality that we did are now connected. They have now invested in the computer labs for all the schools. Uh, the health center has been wired up. They had telemedicine equipment lying uh, under a blanket for something like two years because they had the equipment that was donated by some very kind government, but um, there was no connectivity to use telemedicine facilities, but now they do, and so on and so forth. Um, so I won't talk much more about that, but at the very granular level, that, that's how we made a difference. And someone mentioned that you know, not no one organization can solve the problem. That's very true. That's why we involve everyone in the community, and the community itself is the, the ones we actually train to deploy and operate the network. We don't parachute in, do it, and leave. We actually train them. So that was our USP, if you like, uh, so that they maintain it, they keep it running. And the other criteria we had was that we'd use very low cost off the shelf equipment. Something, if it breaks, they can walk into the local town and buy something and replace it. So those are the criteria we used. In, in, in ending my little spiel here, I'd just like to say that uh, the Internet Society also has a paper called Removing Barriers, uh, which we focused on Africa in the last round. We will, we are looking at doing further papers like that um, perhaps next year, including some for the Asia Pacific. Um, and. Um, you know, what the paper does is identifies what some of the issues are, be it infrastructure based, uh, you know, technical issues, capacity building issues and so on. So, you know, keep watch, we'll have that out soon. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much for those introductions. I thought that was a really good table setting for the for a further discussion and now I'd like to open up for questions um, from the audience. I see two over there. Uh, let's just go in order Dan and then Mike and then Pepper, Bob. <laughs> okay, uh, good morning. Everybody can hear me okay? Uh, my name is Dan McGarry. I work with the Pacific Institute of Public Policy. Uh, we do, we advocate for better policy making processes throughout the Pacific Islands region. Um, I thought I might just provide a little bit of context, um, you know, sort of the, the view from the coal base, if you will. Um, First observation I'd like to make is that, uh, uh, you know, I don't want for a moment to denigrate the great work, you know, that we're seeing from Facebook, from Google especially, um, in making that, you know, the social interaction, all those possibilities um, that come with the Internet, making them available to people in the developing world. I can tell you for a fact that it's hugely, hugely popular and quite influential in many ways. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I think it's the value of social communication, you know, online as a development tool 
is, uh, in spite of all the all the rhetoric flying around, I still think it's underrated, and I don't think it's, it's uh, as well understood as it could be. But that said, and you knew there was a but coming. Uh, that said, it's a necessary but not nearly sufficient uh, condition for you know really leveraging uh, digital communications in the developing world. The uh, observations um, from uh, our friend from Telefonica are on the market in a great many ways. We have seen some good public-private partnerships. Um, we have seen some failed public-private partnerships as well, uh, partly because in the Pacific we have very, very unique uh, conditions. Um, in Tonga recently, uh, which they, they just turned on their, uh, their fiber optic cable, uh, about a month ago, uh, no, a few months ago, um, with uh, the generous assistance of David and his colleagues at the World Bank, as well as the, the folks at the Asian Development Bank. Um, I, I spoke with the chairman of the Tonga Cable uh, Company, and uh, he talked about all the lengths that they had gone through to get commercial, you know, wholesale bandwidth down to about $500 U.S. a megabit, and that translates, you know, at very high contention rates to a wholesale cost of about $25 per customer, um, which is about five times what the average Tongan can afford. That's for a single megabit of connectivity. I spoke further with some of the telecoms um, people, the, uh, including uh, some finance people, and they just got this deer in a headlights look when we started to talk about making internet affordable. I mean, you know, they, they really genuinely do want to do as much as they can because, of course, it's in their best interest. You know, if there is a way to make money, they want to do it. And uh, certainly some of the countries operating in the development world right now are very aggressive in terms of their margins. But the plain fact is that the cost of infrastructure, the cost of maintenance, you know, just the, the sort of um, OPEX, I guess, um, and the capacity, Martin, as you rightly pointed out, are, the, the, the conditions are prohibitive. Um, and so when we talk about multi-stakeholderism, um, I think from my perspective, it's a much broader Umbrella, a much bigger umbrella than we might consider. You know, you hear a lot about you know, government, business, civil society, uh, with a lot of sort of hand wavy stuff around the edges. But the plain fact is that we need to have a different, a fundamentally different understanding of investment in terms of how this infrastructure gets built out. Because the last mile, it's not just a matter of putting out connectivity. You need power. Um, you need a, a huge number of secondary services, financial services. Retail financial services in the Pacific are a joke. Um, we've actually got fairly decent bandwidth in a lot of the municipal centers, but uh, you, you can't do a thing with it. So the bottom line is that we do need a fundamental uh, rethink about how we're going about it. There's been great work so far, um, but there's much more that needs to be done. And I'm, for one, I'm, I'm just not thrilled that we don't have many development institutions here at, uh, at the IGF. So um, congratulations on, on everything that you've done. Uh, and I'd just like to underline the fact that there is a huge amount more uh, that remains to be done. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, any, any comments or thoughts on that? Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you for what you said uh, before you got to the butt. Um, I, and I suppose one of the things we recognize as a company is that there's much of our growth has been demand driven and it's been demand driven in terms of often consumers telling other consumers hey you should get on Facebook then we can connect that way so we, we've seen you know, phenomenal growth get to 1.1 billion we recognize that actually getting to the next to the, the next billion and the one after that and the one after that will not cannot just be demand driven so I absolutely support what you say um, I suppose the question is what could we do around this table in terms of that fundamental re fundamental rethink it's all very well saying it but then how do you what does it involve I suppose so I'm, I'm really here to listen and learn from the, 
colleagues who are here about that. I love the deer in the headlight statement. Um, and, and so, just so that people have a, uh, a reference point, if the wholesale price once delivered inside Tonga is sitting at about $500 megabit after an undersea cable is installed. The other end of that cable, if we consider that to be Los Angeles, California, the wholesale price of bits in that city is below 50 cents a megabit, one thousandth of that price. That multiplier alone just stops you in your in your tracks trying to work out how to do deliverable um, bandwidth. And I uh, I don't know the economics of that cable, um, but it's better than it was. But unfortunately, not a brilliant way forward. I'm going to bring up a quick point. Um, if if we if we talk about geography, this is actually a key a key point. The places that have been successful at the infrastructure game at, at, at coming up with affordable prices have been places that become natural gateways for other places to interconnect with. Tonga is not in that camp, unfortunately, but slightly to the west in Fiji, they were in that camp. They bid and successfully got um, to be part of the landing site for undersea cables towards Australia, a massive marketplace. And they benefited as a side result of that because the cable stopped. 99% of the bits continued, but the fact that it stopped gave them an ability to um, uh, to take advantage of infrastructure costs uh, far nicer, I think, than the, obviously um, in the example of Tonga. And, and that's hard for some places to do, but for other places it may be worth thinking about. Understand how, um, uh, and this is all about looking at a map and looking at geography, how could you become a gateway to other places, share the load, share the cost, and therefore reap the benefits of, of, of the more efficient pricing model. Uh, I think we'll, we'll move on then to, to Mike, then um, Pepper, see a hand there, and then... Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, I have a question for the representative from Facebook regarding the exclusive focus on mobile technologies. I was wondering about the rationale for that when we've heard already from the panel about uh, the need for more of an ecosystem approach with uh, the importance of Wi-Fi technology, for example. There are other delivery mechanisms such as TV white space and the need for electrical power delivery as well. Um, so I was just wondering how Network justifies this rather than narrow focus just on mobile technologies. Thank you. Um, yeah, the focus is very much on mobile devices, so it's not just about mobile networks. We also think Wi-Fi is incredibly important um, in terms of that, that kind of asset. So we're certainly exploring uh, opportunities for working with uh, people who are trying to bring Wi-Fi to unconnected. Uh, uh, geographies, but very much expected that most people will want to access via mobile because that's where the big growth is. So of our 1.15 billion users, some 850 million are using Facebook on a mobile device. And when they use Facebook on a mobile device, they are much more engaged. They spend much more time in it, on it. So that's you know, it's one of the reasons why Mark flipped the company last year to become a mobile first company. If that's where we see our users are most want to uh, enjoy Facebook and use it. So that's, that's why we're focused there. <coughs> and certainly in terms of, I was in Nigeria with Jennifer recently and that was very much the focus of, of discussion there. So <coughs> in terms of the markets that we're focused on, it is mobile devices that are key. Great. Uh, Pepper? Thanks. Robert Pepper, Cisco. So actually I want to come back to, I was going to um, pick up on Raj's comments, but then the last one on uh, is related, which is mobile wireless. Um, so one of the things I think that's important is to note that, number one, virtually all of the devices that people are using today are wireless, are connected as wireless devices. 
right, the number of devices that will be connected with Ethernet is declining dramatically. And if you take a look um, at the data, the amount of data going to wireless connections, whether it's mobile data, um, Wi-Fi, which is offloading mobile data, or fixed Wi-Fi, that is going to be, uh, it's already over half of the data, it's going to be two-thirds of the data. So the devices will be wireless devices. Um, that's number one. Uh, second, and related to that, you know, there's this um, false choice debate that people sometimes raise, which is, is it going to be fixed or mobile, right? And if you think of mobile, a lot of people, some of you have heard me say, you know, operators talk about mobile networks. There's no such thing. The networks are not mobile. The networks don't move. I do. You do. Right? The networks, in fact, are fixed, even if they are wireless networks. The mobile satellite is sort of a footnote exception. What that means is that when you connect these devices with wireless technologies, whether it is macro cell, which is licensed for outdoors when you're moving around, high velocity, right, your cars, uh, or it's small cell when you're indoors or outdoors but not moving around, and that's predominantly going to be Wi-Fi. The answer is yes, both, but none of that will be scalable unless it's connected back to fiber. Right. So the future architectures clearly are going to be this heterogeneous network of macro cell, licensed, small cell, Wi-Fi, Femto, Pico, but mostly Wi-Fi, all aggregated and backhauled into fiber. Without that, without that, it won't work. And so when we're looking at affordability, where are the barriers on the affordability? It's not in the low cost. Wi-Fi, it's not the low-cost devices or the low-cost Wi-Fi connections, uh, and you know, we can talk more about those. Um, it's the barriers tend to be middle mile or backhaul to very low density areas, um, and that's what we need to be thinking about. And that also other ways to affect that are IXPs, um, which lower the cost within continents and within regions, also to keep traffic within regions. And I love, you know, like one of the things I love about Martin is that he actually looks at where the traffic flows and traffic flowing from Bali to Amsterdam. Huh? Right? So these are things that if people know they can fix. One last point, though, on Raj is where I uh, actually disagree with Raj. Um, the statement about auctions, um, the reality is that we actually know that what drives pricing is not spectrum auctions. It's the level of competition. Uh, and if you have competition, it drives prices down. The uh, price paid for spectrum in a properly designed auction is like any other input, right? 80% um, of the cost of building the wireless networks is civil engineering of masts, towers, backhaul, electricity, um, security, backup generators. The spectrum is a rounding error. The radio is a rounding error. And actually, we can have a separate conversation. But empirically, um, spectrum auctions do not raise retail prices if the markets are competitive. If the markets are not competitive, you can give away the spectrum and you're still going to have prices that are too high. Okay, um, thank you. Looks uh, like there's no comment. The next question, yes, please. Uh, just a, for Martin, keeping data local, is that going to stop other people from having a look at it? So if, um, if the president of Mexico had, had all his email in Mexico, would that have stopped somebody in the U.S. from reading it? Uh, a good question, a little out of my um, out of my league, but I'll talk about it from a from a where bits flow point of view as opposed to uh, anything else. Um, one of the wonderful things about the internet, and the reason why. You know, I could, I could, I could help do this quick fix yesterday. Um, um, and why I do look at bits, actually, to have a sort of, you know, like who I am, is that the internet 
the routing of, of internet bits is unbelievably transparent. The global routing tables are truly global. This network sitting here, which was built for IGF, is part and parcel of the global internet. It has what's called an autonomous system number, a unique number that identifies it in the world. It has a set of address, addresses, IPv4 and IPv6, that are allocated from the local, um, in this case, uh, country registry, but because it's Indonesia, but, but out of the regional internet registry. And the addresses and the routing of that exist on every internet router around the globe. So, for example, in com or in comparison, uh, and actually Mexico is a brilliant example of this, there was a comment at the microphone during the wicket in Dubai in December where the gentleman from Mexico said, we don't like our voice traffic flowing via another country and then another country. I'll ignore all the countries that he mentioned. Uh, I should I should not be country specific here at, at IGF anyway. Um, and then end up at its destination. We want better control of that. And in the voice world, it turns out that's actually quite hard. The way that voice at the wholesale level is resold, the way uh, signaling system 7 works. But in the internet world, it's totally transparent. So if the traffic did flow from Mexico, and I'll, I'll pick it arbitrarily, over the border, where 99% of all the fiber is anyway, into uh, the United States, and then flowed around somewhere and then flew, flowed, uh, flowed back to somewhere else in Mexico, maybe a different service provider, um, the thing is that all that is transparent and findable and seeable, um, oh, hopefully, and fixable, because it's obvious. Um, there is, um, uh, there are a couple of the major players in Indonesia um, that I can see that by bandwidth and some of the traffic flows to, to, not all, but some flows up to Singapore and then flows back to a different service provider uh, here in Indonesia. We see that around a lot of the world. It's been pretty flushed out in, 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 um, in Europe um, and it's been flushed out in most places in, in, in Asia. You will see Japanese traffic stay within inside Japan. So I don't know the specifics of the Mexico example, but the point is that in the internet, that routing is 100% visible and 100% therefore fixable. So dealing with the answer from the infrastructure point of view, I just want to hit one subtle point. There was a project in Canada done out of Toronto called, I think it was IX Maps. I think it's ixmaps.ca. I'll find the URL. And they basically said, we want to map all the traffic in Canada that flows down towards the United States, maybe from, let's say, the West Coast, Vancouver, and then end up going back over the border into the East Coast, let's say, Toronto or Montreal. There's an economic reason why that happens. Trans-Canadian bandwidth is still quite expensive. You pop south of the border into the United States, and you're dealing with commodity pricing of bandwidth, much cheaper. But all of a sudden, you're in another country. So your question could well be very valid for the Canadian. And there is this example, and it, they're quite explicit about why they don't want to see this happen. Um, and I'm, I don't want to quote from the website until I find the right URL and use their language. However, it's a great study. And the economics of fixing Canada would be wonderful um, so that traffic truly does stay, in their case, north of the border. Um, you, you, you need to look at examples like that to see um, how this is done. But the point about that study is it's totally open. It uses internet tools to, to measure it and it's absolute. If a bit does flow down to the US, you see it. It's, it's all there. Great, thank you. We had the two gentlemen sitting next to Pepper, first on the left and then on the right. And then uh, Lorenzo, I think. Uh, so. Mark Sama um, was in Venio, and Venio is a nonprofit organization. We focus on getting connectivity and access to ICTs in general, really out to underserved rural areas, mostly in Sub Saharan Africa. Um, but actually, underserved in that context means often secondary tertiary towns as well, because your real bandwidth, real broadband opportunity 
for use ends up um, stopping in places like Mombasa and Nairobi, and after that it gets very difficult after. I think technology is a key component to that. Um, things like Lumen, things like compression, efficiency gains are a key component to it. But ultimately, I think it's more of a business and a market failure or an opportunity to grow those kind of um, inputs. It's typically a very non-diverse ecosystem of bandwidth delivery in many of these countries. You have maybe two or three mobile operators who are competing for the market. Um, and that really stifles, I think, the competition um, to provide services, ultimately. Um, those two or three mobile operators provide most of the infrastructure they need by themselves. And what I've seen happening is when regulation opens up and gives more uh, entrance to the market access, suddenly you see middle mile providers develop providing fiber um, independent of those actual carriers who then sell it at wholesale rates to smaller new providers. Um, I think another one is Spectrum. Um, Spectrum is often purchased on a nationwide basis, but often not used on a nationwide basis. So if there's ways to reallocate Spectrum or dynamically reuse Spectrum in areas certain service providers don't want to use the Spectrum in if they don't want to invest. Um, I think that would be a huge change and huge opportunity to get more competition into the market. Um, and ultimately, really encouraging, um, once these systems are in place, local entrepreneurs to provide bandwidth services and establish basically um, service providers in their country, sort of what um, I think Martin and, and Raj um, alluded to. Really getting that ecosystem together, I think, is, is a key component. Um, because then you can have competition in the actual technology sector of mobile versus Wi-Fi versus Loom versus whatever it might be. But as long as the markets are really cornered by just one or two operators, um, all the users are losing out. And I think on the other side, the content providers or the people who actually provide services and, and content on the internet are losing out because there's just not enough choice in the market. And that's one thing I think is really important to, to see how we can change that. Um, I just wanted to uh, pick up a little bit on the on the uh, discussion on spectrum, right? Um, to address an earlier point about uh, spectrum costs, I don't think uh, that uh, I, well, costs is uh, very important, but it's equally important to see spectrum provisions. Okay, so uh, in, uh, discussion. I would like to see a little bit more discussion around unlicensed spectrum uh, in terms of. Uh, in terms of openness as to who all can use it rather than uh, just in terms of cost of whether it should be auctioned or, or that uh, method of, of allocation of spectrum, right? Uh, and secondly, uh, the, the counter problem can also exist uh, to the nationwide uh, auction, uh, uh, provision of spectrum, right? Where you have uh, different circles being broken up Okay, and nationwide players who haven't actually got the right to that spectrum, uh, to the same spectrum on a nationwide basis, have difficulty in, in actually providing uh, a service on a nationwide basis, especially when the rules also prohibit uh, relicensing or sublicensing. And, and so there can be the opposite problem as well existing. So, uh, and that has happened in India as a matter of fact. I would just like to build on on, on that. Um, I mean, uh, I think I think you're right in the sense that, as we said earlier, the full ecosystem approach is the right one. Um, I have to disagree a little bit on that. If you have three mobile operators competing, really competing, you do not have competition in the market. I mean, uh, there are there might be discussion about if it's enough competition or whatever, but uh, the experience shows that there is competition. I mean, connectivity prices in the world have gone down dramatically. There's no other industry sector uh, I know where prices have uh, been so deflationary as, as in our industry. Um, there's still, I mean, this is not perfect. There might be exceptions and there might be countries where this is not happening. But then the reason is because maybe the competition is not, not good enough or the conditions are not right. Um, having said that, of course, you know, you might imagine that a company like ours investing billions every year. I mean, we're looking into ways to make it cheaper. I mean, we, we don't like that. I mean, uh, buying Spectrum and investing uh, are, the, are the most difficult decisions taken by our management every year. Um, 
And so, of course, we're looking into all ways we can improve that and, and make it cheaper. In the end, we want to sell a product, we want to sell an activity. It's not that we that we wish that no one gets on that. So this is our core business, as I said. So I think we're looking into that and, and we're trying to, to improve it. And as I said earlier, and, and I think Pranesh touched on the point as well, um, what we've seen is very often that, um, for example, uh, cheap devices, yes, it is an issue. I mean, it's not that uh, smartphones are really cheap um, compared to, to at least to the income in some countries. And we started, therefore, with the Mozilla Foundation, a project which I think is fantastic, which is uh, working on, on Firefox also, which is an open operating system. There are no license fees, no, no royalty state, um, which is one of the reasons why smartphones become much cheaper. Um, and we have devices now on the market, for example, one by Sandy, a, a Chinese pro um, producer. Um, you can buy them for 50 euros, um, which is fantastic and fantastic price compared to others. So I think these are the solutions we have to improve and obviously we have to look into new ways of giving the last mile access and everything, every idea as well. Mark, I just wanted to comment on what you said about spectrum, particularly in rural areas, you know, potentially not being used because Christoph said the investment in the business case for, for building out networks um, can be very difficult. One thing we've been working with governments on is mapping the spectrum. Um, because, as you said, you can see that while licenses tend to be given out nationally, that's not how they're being used. And we've mapped spectrum for South Africa and Senegal recently. And it's amazing to see, even though everyone says spectrum is a scarce resource, how much spectrum is actually available to be used if you consider location and also time particularly when you're talking about um, TV bands or even radio bands. Um, and so one of the benefits of looking at TV white space technology is how can we use that available spectrum to deliver broadband in the right places and at the right time. And that can be done, for instance, through a spectrum database that can then dynamically manage when um, different frequencies can be used to deliver broadband. And that technology can be used by mobile operators, by ISPs to add competition to the market. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're really interested in, in supporting. And um, we're wrapping up a trial in South Africa that is using TV white space backhaul to deliver um, broadband to a number of schools. And it, it has shown that there is no interference with other licensed users of the nearby bands. Um, and so now it's about working with regulators so that they're enable this technology to be used, whether it's uh, unlicensed or through other management. Okay. Please. Thank you. Uh, I am Jayanta Fernando from Sri Lanka. Uh, firstly, I thank the ISOC for putting this panel, panel on removing barriers to connectivity. Uh, just a quick uh, question and some thoughts. Uh, coming from my own jurisdiction. Uh, in terms of removing barriers to connectivity, we, uh, uh, I mean, we are mindful about the spectrum issues and the internet bearing point issues and all that. We, are, we try to provide a homegrown solution as much as possible. But one area which helped improve connectivity was to set up a mirror of one of the root servers in our country which was facilitated by, by my agency in conjunction with the APNIC and of course we got support from ISOC in that whole exercise. So just a thought and a question perhaps to the panel, uh, how important are mirrors of root servers and whether, to what extent do they help remove barriers to connectivity and empower people with faster and easier access to the I think Raj should talk about the, the, the work at ISOC, but I just want to deal with the technical issue. This is about as fundamental as it gets. Um, the, 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 the example I want to give was presented a week or so ago in Europe at the, um, uh, at the right meeting, which is the RIR for Europe and the, and the Middle East and, and, uh, and Russia. And the example was, was actually somewhere that was fairly close to, to um, uh, the middle of Europe. This was a, um, uh, a monitoring of the root name server 
um, response time that was done in Belgrade, um, uh, Serbia. And it showed that uh, the installation of a uh, local root instance um, took them from about a 44 millisecond latency, which is nothing if you're in Tonga, by the way. I mean, 44 milliseconds is, 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 a, is, a, is a, you know, a couple of hours on a flight at best, not even actually now think about it, down to, um, down to literally a handful, three, four milliseconds inside the city. That latency translates to each and every user as they are doing a web search, as they are typing in www. whatever they feel like, hopefully with a local domain, at the, a local uh, CCTLD at the end of it. But that root original request is fundamental to, to part of that query. The DNS system is fundamental to the way the internet works. It isn't just the installation of one root name server. There are a total of 13 named root name servers Putting three or four inside a local um, uh, facility, moving uh, a copy of one into Tonga, for example, makes all the difference in the world. Um, I keep picking on Tonga, but it's, it's so far away from everything, it's a, it's a great example. Um, so it wins, it wins hands down, and there should be hundreds, if not many hundreds, uh, of these instances. Uh, not all the same letter. The letters, by the way, just for those people that, um, just as a quick aside, Root name servers are named A through M. Um, there are 13 of them. They are distributed around the world uh, to different organizations to manage. But then again, they then redistribute the instances, the multiple copies of the same thing, mirror images, even further around the world. And um, all of this, again, the wonderful thing about the internet, totally available, a quick, uh, a quick search on something like root name server locations will give you a wonderful map which changes and improves. So um, it does make a difference. It makes a difference to the end user. Um, it isn't a lot of bits, but it's the latency. It is the responsiveness that changes. And Raj, you can talk about the wonderful work that pushing them more and further away. Now, I think I'll leave it there. You've covered the technical stuff pretty well. So yeah, uh, there are a lot of organizations who do run the root service, and most of them are quite happy to talk with you and. Uh, set up a mirror instance in your locality. So, you know, if, if anyone here is interested, ask me and I can point you in the right direction. Thanks. Great. Uh, Lorenzo, did you? No. Okay. okay. To add to the point that Raj just made about the um, instances, this is something that the Internet Society is very keen to promote when we're installing and helping local partners. And I stress partner because we don't go where we're not asked to go, and we don't do anything usually by ourselves. It's either a partnership with organizations on the ground, uh, companies, uh, other nonprofits, but we're very keen to make sure that we work, when we're building out IXPs with the partners that these, uh, these instances are part of that process. So I just wanted to put that out there. And I did want to sort of elaborate or note an issue that has come up about internet exchanges and monitoring. And IX isn't designed to do deep packet inspections. That's not what it's all about. There may be issues related to ISPs that have been asked to do that, but I want to clarify that when we're going into developing emerging markets and putting in basic um, capability for an internet exchange point, we don't do that, and they don't do that. The objective is to bring competitors and others together to exchange local traffic, keep it local, create a cheaper uh, environment because the quality of service goes up, latency goes down, volume of traffic spikes. We've seen it from the Democratic Republic of Congo to Ecuador to other places that we're working in. The fellow sitting next to me is our regional director for Latin America, he's shaking his head because <laughs> I work very closely with him. But I just want to be clear that the Internet Society and other organizations that are trying to build local connectivity, get a stronger, more resilient infrastructure, are doing what we do in a neutral, from a neutral perspective. There may be other places in the world where that may be going on in the monitoring, but when we use the word monitor, we're talking about how much volume there is from a daily, a weekly, or a monthly basis so that others can see that there's the investment potential in that country. So when we say measure and monitor, we're talking about the health of the infrastructure, the management, the efficiency of the infrastructure. So I just want to be clear that when we speak in that language from our Internet Society and other partner perspective, we're talking about how you make the network better 
more efficient and manage better. Just wanted to add that perspective. Yeah, Jamie Bedley from New Zealand. If I can just go back a step to the uh, spectrum discussion before. Uh, New Zealand's implemented a somewhat experimental policy that's designed to be a halfway house between the unlicensed regime and the typical option slash management rights regime. It's known as um, Managed Spectrum Park. Uh, features of the um, uh, approach are uh, heavy user or loser provisions, uh, no national operator across all the licenses across all the bands. Um, the spectrum is um, harmonised with band, 48, uh, band 41 and band 38 and LTE TDD and, um, and it's actually regionally divided so I think from memory there's about 20 sub-regions within New Zealand that operators can licence up and use that. Also another feature is multiple operators can licence up in the region but the conflict resolution between them and how they um, manage interference is organised between them. So if anyone's wanting to look at uh, different approaches, then I suggest you have a look at Managed Spectrum Park. Thank you. Any, any comments on that? Other questions? Yes, please. Hi, uh, Mike Kelly from the American Bar Association. We've, um, we've heard a lot about the front end problems uh, that you encounter with connectivity, spectrum power, all these kinds of things. But I'm, I'm kind of curious about the back end issues, and that is sustaining connectivity once it's connected. And, and I was really interested to hear what the Internet Society does. You know, if you go to a village in the Congo and you get connection, how, I mean, do you select someone to train in that local society to be tech support, or do you leave an Internet Society person behind for a period of time to do that, or how does that all work on the back end of sustaining connectivity? So our USP for that project is, you know, we say by the community for the community. So what that means is, you know, we don't parachute in, do the stuff, and leave. Our whole idea is that we will train the local community to run, operate, and maintain the network. Um, and that's why sometimes it's a bit of a challenge because not all communities can support that sort of uh, skill sets. Um, we started off the project by first doing the training. It was just people training, getting the locals involved, and it was typically people who had done um, high school, had finished high school or secondary school, whatever you want to call it. Um, some of them had some basic tertiary education. Um, some IT skills, they knew what a computer was, how to operate it, and then we spent uh, two weeks training them. Then we went back uh, three months later and did it all over again so that they were refreshed on what, uh, you know, they, knew what they were doing. Um, the other part of the sustainability uh, equation, if you like, is the fact that, you know, the backhaul costs money as well. Uh, the equipment costs money. Or maintaining the equipment costs money as well. So what we try to do is come up with some sort of model uh, for them where they, the, the network actually generates revenue. And the way we do that is that if, uh, for example, um, one of the government offices wanted to get connected, so they pay for that connection cost in terms of the equipment cost. And then they also agree that they, we can use them as a relay station to get further out um, in, in, yeah, into the area. Um, and then there are uh, things like cyber cafes have sprung up, which did not exist in the area before. Uh, the schools got wired up. So you know, everyone pays a minimal cost to access the network because you know, there's a cost associated with it. But it's not a commercial operation. It's basically whatever it costs us divided by the number of people on it. Um, but we let those decisions be the community decision. We don't decide for them. You know, what we show them is a working model. This is how it works. This is how it operates. Here are some suggestions how you can sustain it. Um, and the ones who are really, truly, fully committed are the ones we see that become successful. And in terms of choosing the community, I think that was your other question. Um, we have local partners on the ground who do a lot of that selection process. And the essential, essential criteria is local buy-in. The village elders or the elders council must have buy-in. They must support it. If they don't, the project fails. That's what we've seen. Actually, if I can uh, ask a follow-up on question on that, and you know, I guess take the moderator's prerogative. Um, so we've heard all these great initiatives to lower the cost, make the internet more efficient. Uh, clearly, that's going to increase 
usage for people who already have access and, and get more people online. But I was wondering if we could just delve a little into the demand side and build on what you're saying about the literacy, um, local languages. I know Google's working a lot in local languages in Africa and other places to, you know, really to make sure that uh, once access is available that the most people see it relevant and, and, and take it up. And if Pranesh had his hand up. Um, that's precisely what I wanted to, uh, to touch on uh, in response to that question. So uh, I'll just point out a few things. One, in India what the government is doing is uh, it's rolled out more than a 100,000 uh, kiosks, uh, uh, community service centers, where uh, the main focus is on, on government services, but uh, it also serves as a place where internet uh, availability is spread through. Uh, not all of them are equally functional, but it's uh, working much better uh, in, in a sense than one would expect. Uh, so, and, and there are some studies on it uh, as well. Uh, if you go online and search for common service centers in India, uh, on the government's website itself, you'll, uh, you'll find some studies about it. Uh, secondly, one very important thing in, in actually keeping uh, demand up is entertainment. Uh, not people don't just go online, you know, with a thirst for Wikipedia uh, all the time. They are looking for entertainment very often. And, uh, and one uh, very important thing that, that emerges out of this is piracy. So uh, piracy is actually something that, that does drive, uh, drive the, the demand for internet access. Uh, one way to actually uh, to help the, uh, this situation is to, uh, and what's, happened, uh, what's happening right now in India, uh, one of our studies uh, has shown that uh, piracy is actually great for the industry and uh, for the entertainment industry. And what uh, many music companies are now doing is that they're co-opting uh, pirates, uh, especially those who are at the mobile phone store, who are uh, doing side loading onto, onto mobile phones, etc. They're actually making, uh, they're not demanding their regular uh, royalty fees anymore. They're actually, they've actually realized that what uh, the market finds sustainable in terms of royalty much, much, much lower in this digital age, and they're profiting out of it. So, the, so unlike in the West, where music companies are facing difficulties, while movie companies are doing great, uh, even despite or even because of piracy, uh, in India, the the music companies are actually starting to change what they're doing now and earning money out of it by co-opting erstwhile pirates by lowering cost points. Uh, and a few other things that I quickly want to mention. Uh, one, text-to-speech and speech-to-text is incredibly important in getting uh, illiterate and semi-literate people on the internet. Uh, unfortunately, this costs more amount of bandwidth. Okay, so, uh, but we still have to focus on, on and, and it's, in my opinion, un uh, uh, an area that's that's uh, way too neglected. Okay, and so that's something that that if we want to get on, uh, get to people who can't type, that is something we have to focus on. And secondly, uh, government regulations in some ways are good. So parts of what I've seen, shared spectrum, uh, unlicensed spectrum, shared spectrum needs good government regulation. Unlicensed spectrum needs less government regulation. So there. Uh, so there's no uh, one level of government regulation that's good for, for everything, right? And one area where government regulation is good is to say that when you're selling a mobile phone, uh, you have to have it enabled in, you have to provide multiple local languages on it if you're selling it in, in, uh, in this particular country. Okay? And that actually isn't that very costly, but just because uh, there isn't enough of market incentive generally to, to get that done because the folks who can't talk in English or who can't use the, the keyboard don't con constitute the market for, for uh, many companies, right? So, uh, and they use the internet in, in very different ways with video being a, a more important constituent, uh, important constituent of, the, of the data for uh, the illiterate people, right? So, that is also something that, that could do with a little bit of uh, light touch government. Okay, great. Uh, I think we've got time for two more questions, and 
uh, from the lady there and then from, from Edward. Um, please. Thank you. Not really a question. I got lost looking for this room. Apologies. Um, my name is Medna. I'm from the World Wide Web Foundation. And one of the things we do is the Alliance for Affordable Internet that was spoken about during the opening ceremony. And um, as I followed through webcast, I followed that you've covered most of the issues. But I just wanted to come back to the things that the Alliance is doing and will continue to do. One is um, encouraging discussion and advocacy among partners. The second is research. But the third and the most important for which I want to speak to in this session is policy support, um, especially in areas where bandwidth is expensive. But why is it expensive? What are the policy and regulatory sides to it? Uh, and one of the things that the A4A I will be doing will be sharing best practices within the country. Recently we signed an MOU with Nigeria to kick off because Nigeria's got the biggest market in Africa and we do believe that we can make a success story of Nigeria that will ripple across the continent. So one thing will be the liberalization of the market with an open competitive environment which we feel is very important and I want to speak to practices that encourage lower cost structure because that is actually one of the huge issues. What's the cost structure in place and what are the regulations around it and what can be done to reduce this. So one of that will be streamlining processes for infrastructure de deployment and sharing. The other will be effective spectrum management. It's been spoken to. I followed it online here. Uh, then enabling innovative usage through unlicensed spectrum. Uh, Jennifer has spoken a bit of, about TV white spaces. And no luxury taxation or excessive custom tariffs. That's a whole lot. But countries don't know. Uh, we spoke, we're speaking with the minister two weeks ago and she was saying the country needs taxes but yes we agree that, that we need to strike that balance but we need to give policy support to these countries to know how they reduce these tariffs while at the same time maintaining this balance I'm, I'm available to speak more and to connect anyone who would like to know more about the initiatives of the Alliance for Affordable Internet and once again thank you to our advisory council members who are here, thanks Thank you. Um, Edward, and then if we have time. Oh, sorry. Of course. I want to thank you as well. Um, you're a prolific tweeter about this subject. I've been following you for quite a while, and um, it, is, uh, it, it is one of whether you're here or you're back in Cote d'Ivoire or in Nigeria, I get to, to see an aspect of, of your interest in the internet um, from all of the Thank you for that. Okay, Edward. Yes, uh, Edward from IdeaSource. Uh, we are a venture capital and incubators in base in Jakarta, and we're interested in a uh, region in Indonesia as well in region. region. Uh, I just want to comment and add about the accessibility and the demand side. Uh, I was in a panel uh, about the IXP uh, ecosystems. Uh, I think, uh, for uh, for example, in Indonesia, you know, TV is very popular. And the way I see it, you know, is that we the move with the smart TV right now and development from Google of uh, Chromecast uh, with the $35 of uh, device, I think there is going to be an opportunity to uh, have more accessibility and also uh, to create more demand. Uh, I think that's my comment. Can I? So, one of the things that's really struck me about the session is we've been talking a lot about um, you know, how much internet is demand driven, how much of it is availability determined. Uh, in most of our countries, you know, I, I live in the UK, we've still got 9 million people in the UK who have never used the internet. And it's not an availability problem. It's, um, it's a relevance problem. They just don't see the relevance of it. So I think we have to recognize there will always be some people that even when you make the internet available and cheap, they will still not want to use it. Uh, and one of the things that I think has come out of today's session is the sense of well, actually peer-to-peer -peer engagement and learning is fundamental. It's not about representatives of Facebook, Google, A4 AI or anyone else coming in. It's about people like them showing them how they use the internet uh, that can be very helpful. I think also we shouldn't lose sight of, of internet safety uh, and some of the things that we've got used to in, uh, in, 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 in 
in our own countries in terms of these debates actually can be quite fearful um, in, in environments where the internet is very new. And therefore, um, contrary to what somebody said earlier on, maybe this notion of an anchor tenant uh, service that is used to try and entice people into the internet, um, where actually they're not necessarily encouraged to explore too widely initially, might be a good way of, and, and I'm, you know, I think of, of course, being from Facebook, I think of Facebook as potentially that environment, but there are certainly other anchor tenant services that we might use to encourage people we shouldn't discount it, um, and we should explore different uh, pilot exercises like that in order to try and tackle that um, that relevance or fearfulness factor as well about about access. All right, great point. Um, I think the final question then, Pepper. Thank you. I just wanted to respond to the point about taxes. So one of the things that the UN Broadband Commission um, has recommended is that this sector should not be subject to luxury taxes. There'll be taxes. It's not about no taxes, because Minister, as you point out, says, yep, governments need taxes, but taxes on this sector that are above normal business taxes are counterproductive to the goals of affordability and connecting people. This is a sector that's characterized in too many countries by taxes that are equivalent to sin taxes, the taxes imposed on ta alcohol and tobacco. This is not a sin. Right? We should be promoting affordability by lowering taxes, but taxes are a reality of life. It, they just shouldn't be so high as to, as to raise prices, create barriers, and be counterproductive to the goal of affordability. Mr. Chair, um, I'm removing the Web Foundation hat, and I'm wearing my normal scarf, African scarf. I was in New York during the UN week. I bought two laptops. I come from New York and I hit the country I live in, it's a West African country, and I show up with the two laptops and this old one, and so I go to pay the tax, the, is it taxes you pay? Yeah, customs. It is 26%. I have the receipt. And the man looks at me and says, actually I bought those cheap laptops that were on sale. And he still says he does not believe the receipt I have given to him is authentic from Best Buy. And so, instead of evaluating the computers as $700, now he's, he takes the liberty upon himself to say the computers we are worth $1,000. And 26% is $260 for laptops that we are worth $570 at the most. I have the receipt. It's in my name. And at that same place where they are charging me and I felt like strangling someone. Some lady had come in with a printer and had declared the printer as office material. And the guys were saying, you did not declare the ink in the printer. And so we are going to charge you for what, something crazy. And then I left my own course and I really blasted this guy. Have you seen a printer that does not come with an ink? Thank you. Does, does anyone have a final? It's going to be hard to top, but does anyone have a final, <laughs> final word? Martin? Um, I have to do this if you've been wondering why I've been hitting the keys, but the, um, the, the, the undersea cable that just turned off from Tonga to Fiji had no Wikipedia page, but now does. I, I just have to throw things out in public that need to be there, and it's now in the, in the Pacific. Uh, fiber categories and it has its own Wikipedia page so hopefully more people will know about it maybe it will get more use maybe the price will go down that's use and price are related alright well on that positive outcome uh, please join me in thanking the panel for an excellent discussion